Hey there. Um, it's me again. Another Sid vid we're calling them. Um, and yeah, what do I want to talk about tonight? Um, this afternoon, must be about half six here in Sydney. And um, I was thinking, I wanted to do like virology, talk like hardcore virology, like, you know, I lecture you about how viruses work. But there's been something um, ever so slightly different on my mind about, uh, and that's kind of the interesting how this virus has a social dimension. Like, you know, it's, it's, there are not many animals that we can say, and I'm calling the virus an animal, yeah? It's a, it's a stretch, but we, we can do it. And not many animals have a, a large, uh, let's say, social or even political effect on us. But this virus uh, seems to. Um, it's completely changed our behavior. And, and I, w I, was, I was wondering, um, are they, you know, like that, 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 I felt almost uncomfortable talking about that because I don't want this to be about uh, politics. And it really isn't. But, you know, it's, it's almost unavoidable because there, there are not many... Um, examples of of, um, of of biological organisms that shape us so much on a social level. Um, I was actually reminded me of something I read in uh, this book, and I read this book like um, nine in the, probably in the in the two thousands, early two thousands. It's uh, Richard Lewinton. He's quite a famous geneticist, Tracy. If you're watching, there's Richard Lewinton's book. Um, it's called the doctrine of DNA, and and I remember twenty years ago being struck by a passage in this book, because I was studying biology, viruses, bacteria, how they worked, how their genes work, what their genes did, how they functioned in the world, and that's what I was thinking about. And then I read this book, and he had this passage in here, um, and, and I'm, it's all about causes and the effects. And you know, as a as a um, practicing uh, biologist. Um, you know, I was studying tuberculosis and, you know, we understood that tuberculosis was caused by a bacteria and that bacteria was called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. That caused TB, the disease TB. But then he said something in this book which I thought, well, that's a very profound thing. Um, tuberculosis is caused by um, this bacteria, but it's also caused by Poverty and overcrowding. So people living in very difficult, overcrowded conditions are much more likely to catch TB, to die of tuberculosis, to suffer from tuberculosis. In the wealthier countries, it's not an issue. Uh, in poorer countries, it's a major issue. Same could probably be said for um, diseases like malaria. And these are diseases of, of people who are in, develop, in the developing world, let's say. So, you know, um, it's, it's, an, it's not a stretch to say that... Um, you know, apparently small animals like bacteria and viruses have a profound impact on our social behavior. And this virus, well, as we can see, it's a virus that affects everybody. This is, um, Prince Charles has it, um, Boris Johnson has it. These are all people who should be spared of these kind of diseases, right? These are wealthy, powerful people. How can they get sick from a pandemic? Pandemics in our, some part of our brain are supposed to affect people who are living in very challenging, uh, to use a, uh, an unpopular word, third world conditions. That's what our brain is busy telling us. So we are now dealing with this, um, this virus, which is affecting um, all of us. So, you know, that, that's a point I wanted to make. And it struck me because I grew up in um, South Africa, uh, you know, in the, in the in the dark days of, of, of apartheid, uh, in the midst of it. And I remember in the 1980s during, um, uh, you know, just when things were starting to change, but there was a big uprising, essentially. Um, and, and, and the nature of that uprising, shall we call it, was that the, the police decided that African people, black people, were not allowed to gather in, in um, concentrated packs. Uh, you know, like, it was called, it's an illegal gathering. They were not allowed to do that because they could transmit information and that's dangerous. And there would be police on the street and enforcing these laws about people gathering. Now, 40 years later, we talk about social distancing, right? It's so interesting how 
if you don't know what's causing it, again, if you're this interplanetary scientist just looking down, you see, oh, that's interesting. People are no longer allowed to be close together, and there are other people who are enforcing that. Um, you know, we saw images here in Sydney of, of um, police separating people in public areas. There's some footage uh, of, you know, military personnel in uh, townships in South Africa separating gatherings of people. So even though the reasons for why people are now being separated are very different, the appearance of it is the same, which is really fascinating. And that's why there's a very profound social, social aspect to all of this. The other thing I was struck by the other day is I was listening to, I think it was This American Life, a really nice podcast, um, and um, they were talking about the Chinese response to this. How, it is, how is it that um, they've managed to eliminate the virus, essentially, or eliminate um, new cases of the virus, at least now? And, and um, the, just an ordinary citizen of, of, I'm not sure what city it was, was saying, they've got, they're using their very sophisticated technology. They're using high mass surveillance technology. Anyone infected is basically monitored, and you get a score irrespective of who you are, which represents your likelihood of being a carrier of the virus. And, and, and I think it's represented in a QR code. So wherever you go, you scan your code and they basically say, well, your score's too low, you can't go here, you can't go there. And the thing that struck me was the, um, the woman they were interviewing was like, I love this. We, are so, we so love this uh, fact that this technology is making us safe. So um, that's that, and that rang a very scary bell for me. It was like we are now um, accepting that it's absolutely fine to be monitored. Uh, I'm not saying we, because I think a lot of people vary, but but it's it's insidious how it can now start to become acceptable to be monitored by mass surveillance technologies because it keeps us safe. All right, and we've seen this before. People say, well, we don't want our data to be. Um, monitored and a lot of people say well i do because i'm not doing anything wrong and you know it's 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 that whole philosophy is you might not be doing anything wrong in your current context but context changes so it is interesting that a biological agent is having this kind of impact on our social um on our social structure so um that's what i wanted to, I, that's what i wanted to talk about tonight uh, that's what really struck me and has been sort of and gnawing at me, to, so, so to speak, over the last couple of days. I do hope to get something a bit more biological. Uh, uh, but, but as we can see, uh, we can't really separate the biological from the political. From it's all, it's it all seems to be melding into one thing, which has made this virus so fascinating. It's made it so fascinating. And you know, if we just really are mindful and not fearful, but mindful and curious, there's a lot that we can learn about what's happening in our world today. And I mean, the truth of the matter is, we don't really want to go back to the way things were because let's face it, um, we're living uh, in so-called democracies that are very unresponsive to things that are happening around us. I mean, for you know, example, climate change. There's no response to it. It's the same, if not a more intense level of crisis but there's no response to it. So it's interesting how this, the response is so instantaneous, so massive, which is uh, because we can see people, uh, we can see individuals that we know and admire and respect, or at least they're very much in the public eye coming out with us. So it's, it's, it triggers our fear and it triggers our response in a much more vivid way. I remember Jerry Seinfeld uh, once saying that, you know, when you kick your toe on the bottom of the bed, that fear that that feeling of like is 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 nature's way of telling you that uh you know something big has happened right now and we need to respond to it and i think that's uh this virus seems to be that rather big kick in on the toe on the side of the bed for want of a better analogy um anything uh, else you'd like me to chat about please let me know uh, yes um it's lovely to see you although i can't see you but it's lovely to know that you are there um Yes, take it easy, enjoy, or whatever it is that you're doing. We'll speak soon.